Now we're gonna go with Dr. Linda Carlson speaking on managing anxiety and difficult emotions with mindfulness. Dr. Carlson holds the Enbridge Research Chair in Psychosocial Oncology from the University of Calgary. In addition to her many renowned rewards and prizes for work in this area, Dr. Carlson's research in psychosocial oncology, in, oh boy, integrative oncology and mindfulness-based cancer recovery has been published in many high impact journals and book chapters. And she's published a, pat, a patient manual in 211 with uh, Michael Speska entitled Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery, a Step-by-Step -step MBSR Approach to Help You Cope with Treatment and Reclaim Your Life. Welcome, Dr. Carlson. Um, let me just check. We're about 50 minutes behind. So do you want me to just do a half hour or 45 minutes? Rochelle? Um, great question. I think we had uh, built in some time for questions. So maybe if we just skip that part and you do your half hour talk, if that's okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you thank so you. much. As long or short as you want. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, happy to be here today. And thank you, uh, Sharon, for that nice uh, yoga break. That's definitely part of the work we do with our mindfulness-based cancer recovery program. So I'm gonna talk about the cancer experience broadly from a psychosocial perspective, tell you what integrative oncology is, something we call the mix of six to keep in mind, and then specifically around stress management through mindfulness-based interventions, and ours is called mindfulness-based cancer recovery. Um, and then if we have a bit of time, I'll show you some uh, breaths, a sort of um, different types of breath work you can use to help yourself uh, balance your breath and relax called minis. All right, so uh, most of you on this call have been through a personal experience of cancer, so you kind of know about what it feels like. But when we talk about it more academically, I guess, we talk about the central features being things like loss of control, right? All of a sudden, you don't know what's going to happen with your life, how things are going to pan out. You know, everyone sort of had it all laid out, how we thought things would happen, and now it's all kind of thrown up in the air. Of course, when you hear that diagnosis, you think about your life and if it's going to be foreshortened and your potential mortality that comes to the forefront. There's a loss of certainty, predictability, and routine. You know, you may have to take time off work or early retirement and have treatments you don't know, you know, every day or how often that's going to go. There's many emotions people often feel, including grief and loss, a fear about the future, anger, perhaps, why me? Um, there could be uh, self-blame or shame, depending on the type of cancer or the causes and sadness and depression. And lots of symptoms people often experience, including pain, fatigue is the most common symptom, difficulty with sleep, uh, you know, uh, what we call, might call chemo brain or brain fog, cognitive problems. And then no matter how good the, the prognosis, there's always a fear of recurrence. You know, every ache and pain might get your mind racing. What does that mean? Is it you know, a sign that, that cancer is progressing or coming back? There's this term scanxiety we use when, you know, every time you have those follow-up treatments and you have to get tests or scans, there's a lot of anxiety surrounding what the results are going to be there. And of course, for caregivers, um, there's an equally difficult transition period of, of coping with cancer and, and uh, sort of transitioning to that role as caregiver. So when we talk about um, anxiety and depression, which are kind of the most common emotional experiences in cancer, there's certain risk factors to keep in mind for people who are high risk for that. So if you've had a history of mental health problems like depression or anxiety, uh, you're, you're more um, at risk for that during cancer. If you already have poor sleep, um, you know, difficulty falling asleep, getting up at night, that's a risk factor. Um, if you're someone who's uh, really has intense reactions to stress, you're very emotional, um, you know, kind of uh, that also can put you at risk. If you're someone who tends to worry and ruminate a lot anyway, um, if you typically sort of try to avoid coping with difficult things, you know, and kind of escape the situation or, or um, run away a little bit, that tends to be not as helpful. Um, if you don't have as much social support or there's tension in relationships. Um, and if you're socially isolated, you know, which has gotten a lot worse in this era of COVID, um, social support's really important. Um, oh, there's just a, a good reference there for, um, from a clinical psychologist I work with. And I'll share these slides with you afterwards so you can get all the links and references. Um, so I wanna to talk to you about integrative oncology and what that is. I, I noticed um, Richard in this talk sort of touched on this. I'm gonna talk a little bit closer uh, in a bit more detail. Integrative oncology, we define it through the Society of Integrative Oncology where I'm actually the president at the moment. This is an international society. We define it as a patient-centered, evidence-informed field of cancer care that utilizes mind and body practices, natural products and or lifestyle modifications alongside conventional cancer treatments. 
So I'll tell you what we mean by that in a minute. We aim to optimize health, quality of life and clinical outcomes across the cancer care continuum and empower people to prevent cancer and become active participants before, during and beyond. So I think it's important to make a distinction in some terminology um, that Richard was touching on in his, his good session on how to find good information. Um, so we make a distinction between what we call complementary therapies and alternative therapies. So complementary therapies are different interventions, products, procedures. They may not traditionally be part of conventional medical care like surgery, chemo, radiation, but they're typically used alongside conventional treatments. So these may be natural health products, mind, body therapies, exercise, nutrition, and energy therapies, but they're used with conventional care and they're evidence-based. And that's in distinction to what we would call alternative therapies, where these are things that are chosen instead of conventional care. You know, so the clinics in Mexico that Richard mentioned. Um, they're usually not evidence-based and they're often very expensive, require travel to other countries. They're not part of integrative oncology care. So when we talk about integrative oncology, um, it may be the same types of therapies, but these are the ones that are evidence-based and they're used alongside conventional care. So when we look at the, comp the categories of complementary therapies within this field of integrative oncology, there's three main categories. So lifestyle modification, and here we're talking about exercise, physical activity, eating a healthy, nutritious diet, um, sleeping properly, and managing stress. So we call these foundations of wellness. And then there's mind-body therapies, and that's kind of my area of specialization, where we look at things like meditation, yoga, acupuncture, uh, tai chi, qigong, there's many other mind-body therapies, relaxation, imagery, hypnosis, all those kind of things. And then there's the natural health products. So these are largely vitamins, minerals, and different herbs. And again, you know, there is growing evidence for many treatments within each of these categories to be beneficial during oncology care. Uh, it's just quite complex. So we often talk about the mix of six protective factors, and I really recommend this book by a colleague of mine, Lorenzo Cohen, Anti-Cancer Living, it's called. And in this book, he covers diet, physical activity, stress management, sleep, love and support, and also environmental toxins. So how you can make your environment within the house and outside um, safer. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about stress management and slightly touch on sleep in this talk. So I'm going to focus mostly on what we call uh, mindfulness-based interventions or mindfulness. It's become a very trendy term. And I, I like to joke, if you look at Time magazine covers, you think that if you practice mindfulness, you turn into a blissful, beautiful, young blonde woman. <laughs> so there's lots of miss out there around what it really is. Um, it's really not that at all. Our definition of mindfulness is simply paying attention on purpose in the present moment with an open accepting attitude. So it's kind of two things. It's a way of being in the world. You can be more or less mindful no matter what you're doing, right? It's just a matter of how much attention you're actually paying to it, what, whether you're washing the dishes or mowing your lawn, right? Um, and it's also a practice though of mindfulness meditation that trains us in the ability or the skill of being mindful because mindfulness is simple, but it's not always that easy. So you can look at this cartoon to kind of illustrate that. Right. So you've got the human. And I always say, who's more mindful, the human or the dog? Right. And the human is not seeing what's in front of them. Their mind is cluttered with all kinds of things. But the dog is right there in the moment. So actually, maybe we should all be a bit more like our dog sometimes. And this photo just illustrates the practice of setting aside time, sitting down, practicing mindfulness meditation. You don't have to sit cross legged on a rock to do this, but it's just a sort of uh, easy illustration. So if. You think about your attention being uh, in the present moment. Um, if it's not in the present moment, what's your mind doing instead, right? So research shows we have anywhere from 50 to 70,000 thoughts every day. I mean, that's a lot of thoughts, right? So how many of those are actually in the present moment? Well, the researchers have looked at this in various ways and sort of pinged people throughout the day and said, what are you thinking about? How are you feeling? And the number that has come, uh, come along is about half the time. About half the time we're not in the present moment. And often people say, oh, I thought it was more like 90% of the time I wasn't thinking about what I was doing. So about half the time our minds are wandering. And it also turns out that people report feeling happier when their attention is in the present moment, no matter what they're doing. So why would that be, perhaps? Well, if you think about where your mind is going when it's wandering, often it's to the past, right? So we may be ruminating or saying, oh, if only this, if only that, shoulda, coulda, woulda, why me? And then you get down and depressed, you might get angry and resentful, right? And so you're having all those negative 
feelings or, you know, when you're in the past or your mind's racing off to the future, like this guy, right? You're worrying about what am I going to do? I, I've got so much to do or what if this happens or what if that happens and you get all worked up and you get all stressed and anxious, right? So you're either depressed and having regrets or you're worrying and you just miss the present moment in which many times everything is just fine. You know, if we can just be there and be present for it and, and sort of train our minds to be more in the present moment. So the focus is more on the now rather than yesterday, which we can't change and tomorrow, which we have no idea how that's gonna pan out. It's just doing our best by being awake and aware now in the present moment. So when we break mindfulness down, we talk about three different components, um, the why, the what, and the how. So the why is our intention. Why would we practice mindfulness? Our definition says on purpose, and there can be many purposes, but the point is that there's an intention to do it. So you may be doing it to help yourself sleep, right? Or to manage pain, or maybe you just wanna be more present in your relationships with your grandkids, whatever it is, there's a kind of a motivation there. And then it's also the core of the practice is what? What do we do? We're training our capacity to pay attention because you can't just be mindful because you want to, because our minds are trained otherwise. So we have to retrain them. And that's attention training. That's the formal practice of mindfulness meditation. And then there's the, how do we do it? The attitudes. It's really important that we have an open, accepting, kind of kind hearted attitude because it's difficult and a bit frustrating at first. And if we start saying, oh, I can't do it. I suck, this is too hard. You're just gonna quit, right? So we need to be patient. We need to be non-judging of our experience, just taking it as it comes. It is what it is. These things take time. It's not like a fast food sort of approach to mindfulness. We have to accept our experience. So um, I'm gonna talk about myths in a second, but you know, it's not always blissful and unicorns and rainbows, right? We have difficult emotions. And so we need to just accept where we are and that's okay. And letting go of the need to control things that are outside of our control not striving for particular outcomes, trusting ourselves, trusting the process and approaching things with what we call beginner's mind, you know, as if you're starting over seeing things for the first time. You know, and if we think, well, that's a big a tall order to do all these attitudes. Well, what would you be like if you were the opposite of these things, right? You'd be a judgmental, impatient, rejecting, grasping, striving, suspicious know-it-all. And that's basically a recipe for stress, right? So I mentioned myths. So mindfulness is not the same as relaxation. You won't always be relaxed when you practice awareness. It's not a form of hypnosis or you're trying to you know, alter your mind state. It's not a form of prayer or a religious activity at all. It can be done very secularly and integrated with whatever religious or spiritual tradition you may already have. And it's not clearing your mind of all thoughts, you know, like the blissful women who look like their minds are blank. No, and it's not always peaceful and calm. It's just awareness of what's happening in the moment as it's happening, the self-compassion and kindness. That's what mindfulness really is. So why mindfulness? Why is it beneficial across so many of these symptoms I talked about? Well, the only certainty in life is change. That's just a fact. But the unwilling to acknowledge and act upon that reality is actually the root cause of all suffering. It's actually the basis of many philosophical systems and awareness of this. So mindfulness is a process by which we can face and accept this inevitability of change and not be overwhelmed by it and not fight against change, which is, which is just a losing battle. So we use a lot of poetry in our program. I love this one from Thoreau. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Right? We can sleepwalk through our days, years pass like that. And what happened? Were we even there for it? You know, we we're so busy planning for the next thing, we miss what's right in front of us. So, this is where I usually do a little breathing exercise, but I think I will skip it because we did have a little breathing exercise just before this. But, you know, even something as simple as the breath is often the focus of the meditation. And without changing it, just noticing it, right? Just actually paying attention to something that's constantly happening in our bodies that we often don't pay attention to. So there's a program, uh, a real classic program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which is uh, training mindfulness skills, uh, and which was developed late in the 1970s, uh, you know, over 40 years ago now by a guy named John Kabat-Zinn, 
um, in the United States. And he wrote this great book, Full Catastrophe Living, about it. It's in the resilient edition now. I highly recommend it. And so he put together an eight-week training program. It combines stress reduction with these mindfulness meditation training techniques. And now there's been lots of research over the decades to show that this MBSR program is very effective for a wide range of physical and psychological disorders and symptoms. If you're uh, you know, into research, there's a great website called GoAMRA, that's American Mindfulness Research Association. It's got research summaries, all the papers you can access there. But it's become quite a sort of scientific uh, you know, focus for many researchers. And this graph here just shows you the growth of scientific papers. Oh, hold on, there should be another line there. Um, from just the, the peer reviewed, literature on mindfulness. So uh, any articles with mindfulness in the title. And so what you're seeing here is that there was barely nothing through the 80s and 90s. And then kind of around here, the first paper we ever did on mindfulness for people living with cancer came out in the year 2000. So we were, you know, at the, the beginning uh, of the start of this whole, you know, exponential growth in mindfulness papers. And so now we're looking at over a thousand published every year in the scientific literature around the use of mindfulness for all sorts of different clinical conditions and, uh, you know, depression, anxiety, all this kind of stuff. So let's turn to mindfulness for cancer patients, survivors, and families specifically. And so the question is why, why would this be helpful? I've sort of touched on this, but you see the spider, he's saying, oh, my life's a mess, doc, you've got to help me. I just seem to be spinning out of control, right? And so people going through cancer can relate to the spider, right? It's again, I talked about this illness experience, all these different symptoms, but it turns out that what I've just described, the mindfulness approach is really helpful across the spectrum of these symptoms. So it teaches skills in emotion regulation. So uh, understanding your emotions, seeing as they come up and as they sort of grow and as they fade away and these attitudes of acceptance, non-attachment, letting go, self-compassion, all of these help us cope with these difficult emotions and experiences. So we have this program we call Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery. And this is just an example of a group of patients in the program. Um, and we developed it back in 1996 with some of my colleagues and I based on personal yoga and meditation practice. And I showed up a year or so later and I knew about MBSR. And so we adapted the program with the MBSR model in mind, but specific to some of the needs of people living with cancer. So this program has been going on clinically in Calgary since 1998. Any cancer patients and family members can sign up. Um, we do it in groups of about, well now 10 to 20 people, um, three times a year. We've had well over 3000 people through the program. And so we've been doing research all those years as well. Uh, so we have the ongoing clinical program, but we embed different research studies um, within that. And we've done work with breast cancer, prostate cancer, you know, um, kind of across the board. So it's uh, started as eight week, now it's a nine week program, uh, about two hour weekly meetings now with one or two instructors. And every week there's a sort of a discussion around home practice, around different topics. And then we practice yoga as well, mindful movement we call it, and different types of meditations. So we do things like body scan, sitting, walking. Um, and there's a booklet everybody gets that includes reading lists and we have uh, recordings that people can use, used to be CDs, but now it's online where there's guided meditations throughout the program. So people keep track of how much time they're meditating. We encourage them to practice every single day. Um, and there's a longer six hour silent retreat as part of the program too. So over the years, Michael and I um, put this program into a book that anyone can use. It's sort of a self-guided program. So it's called Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery. It came out first in 2011. It covers the whole curriculum and it's in a bunch of languages now. I think we've got French, Dutch, Spanish, uh, German, a uh, couple of versions of Chinese um, and others as well. So if you're not able to join a program in person, you can do a home study with the booklet. So I, I briefly mentioned the types of practices, the people in the upper right that are lying there, looks like they're having a nap. They're actually doing a meditation practice called a body scan. They're taking their attention throughout their body very slowly. A fellow in the chair is doing sitting meditation. So you don't have to wrap yourself up like a pretzel to do this practice. Uh, walking slow, kind of mindful walking is one of the core practices. Something called open awareness, just open to whatever uh, is happening in your experience. Uh, we use imagery like a mountain or a lake um, and also practice loving kindness towards oneself and other people. 
when I mentioned yoga. So yoga is a core part of the practice. Um, and again, just getting in touch with the physical body, you know, loosening up a little bit, but really it's more about just mindful movement because we can um, kind of get detached from what's happening physically, especially if we go through different treatments. So as I said, we've been doing research for a real long time on this program, and I'm just going to summarize some of the results, but you can get them all on my website if you're keen to read the papers. Uh, I think it's, yeah, there's the publications right there. So just in a nutshell, you know, this program seems to improve symptomatology that people would be suffering from. So we started looking at stress and mood symptoms and wow, we were actually quite shocked at how um, large the improvements were when we first started doing this. So it helps decrease stress symptoms, improve anger, anxiety, depression, symptoms like sleep and fatigue improve. People do tend to ruminate and worry less. And we have done work with partners as well who show similar improvements. And then improvements in psychological well being, like quality of life, measures of what we would call spirituality or post traumatic growth. And these are asking questions like, you know, is there a sense of connection that you feel with something larger than yourself? Do you feel a sense of meaning and purpose and peace in your life? And overall levels of, you know, mindfulness itself, the ability to be awake and aware as you're going through your everyday life. And we've also done things like take blood samples and saliva samples and looked at what's going on inside the body in terms of blood pressure. Um, we've looked at stress hormones like cortisol. We've looked at an inflammation in um, different cytokines and parts of the, the um, nervous system. And so all these things have improved um, in different ways. We've even looked at the DNA um, which is a marker of cell aging and looked at telomere length and shown that the mindfulness practices affect that as well. So you can find all those papers on my website. But the problem has been too, that not everybody can come to an in-person group. So almost all those studies were done on these in-person groups where people come uh, you know, for eight weeks and they practice. But that's not for everybody. It, depending where you live, you might not have accessibility. It does take quite a bit of time out of your day and the cost of coming and parking and lost salary and childcare, et cetera. And sometimes the symptoms and side effects themselves make it hard to get to the groups if you're just too tired or in pain. Um, also, many people going through cancer have immunosuppression and they're uh, told to avoid crowds and then COVID-19 came along. And so everybody sort of switched to doing things virtually. So we've adapted this program to digital health interventions, they're called. So there's actually a, a couple of different um, versions of it. So one is an online mindfulness-based cancer recovery program um, where we have done some studies and partnered with a company called eMindful. Um, and they now offer it in interactive online real-time groups. We've done a couple of studies looking at that. We're doing one during chemotherapy to see if online mindfulness might help actually prevent some of the symptoms that people get during chemo. And another thing we're working on now, I'll tell you more about in a minute, is creating a mindfulness app. Uh, that people can just use on their phones or on their tablets. And again, we've partnered with an app creating company to put this together. And the latest thing that's kind of fun is that we have done some virtual reality, that's the app, um, some virtual reality guided mindfulness uh, practice specifically for cancer survivors who are experiencing chronic pain. So they can put on the virtual reality headset, they'll get audio guided mindfulness and they'll see this immersive environment of different nature scenes and stuff like that. So we're in the middle of a study on that right now. So the partnership with this eMindful.com company, they have a whole variety actually of different programs that people can sign up for. So not only the mindfulness-based cancer recovery, but it might be too small to see, but they have all sorts of different specifically targeted mindfulness programs. And this is the app I mentioned, it's called the Mindfulness-Based Cancer Survivorship Journey. And it's within this larger app called AM Mindfulness or AM DTX. And so what we did, was take the teaching we do in our mindfulness program and we recorded ourselves teaching and then they turned it into 27 different audio tracks that are listened to over the course of four weeks. And for each week, there's a little teaching session and then there's these experiential things. So movement and meditation and journaling and stuff. So it kind of parallels the in-person program. Now that's a video I'm not gonna show you just for the sake of time. But this is actually a good opportunity for people because we are testing out that app, the MBCS Journey, in a Canada-wide study. It's funded by the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. Um, and so we are actually just about to start. 
we're recruiting 345 cancer survivors. We're actually trying to, to target men a little bit more because often we get more women in these programs. So we'd love to have any, any of you guys who are uh, finished treatment might be interested. Recruiting soon, it's actually about to be launched any time now. Um, and so people on the study would get access to the app on your phone for a year. You use it for a month. We ask you a bunch of questionnaires before and after. So if you're interested, you can email me directly um, and I can, I can put you onto the study team for that. All right, so that's the whirlwind tour of kind of mindfulness in general, the programs, the research. And I want to um, be able to leave you with some practical tools that you can take with you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the nervous system and how we can use something as simple as the breath to control our level of anxiety and um, excitement there. So first of all, we wanna talk about the voluntary versus autonomic nervous system. So it's simple, basically, if I decide I wanna raise my arm, I do that voluntarily. I say, I'm gonna raise my arm and then I raise my arm, right? But there's lots of things your nervous system controls that you don't have to think about for them to happen. So that would include beating your heart, you know, um, breathing, your lungs breathing, all the different hormones that are secreted by your glands, uh, your digestion, all those things are controlled by the autonomic or automatic part of your nervous system. And within that, it's broken down into two what we call arms. So the big A is your autonomic nervous system. The S and the P are what we call sympathetic and parasympathetic. So it's fairly simple. The sympathetic is your fight or flight response, right? That's when, you know, you're driving along, dog runs in front of your car, you, you are automatically activated very quickly. So your heart starts racing, your palms are sweaty, your muscles go tense. That's that fight or flight reactivity. That's controlled by your sympathetic nervous system. But because it's in balance with what's called the parasympathetic, the relaxation side, it's always one or the other. You know, so if your sympathetic is activated, you're obviously not relaxed, right? And so when you're relaxed, you feel this rest phase or this relaxation response, then your fight or flight response goes down. And so what is really good throughout the day or what we're seeking is more balance between those arms so that we, we have you know, balance in our nervous system. So we're not too fatigued or tired, but we're not too jumpy and anxious either. And so it turns out that we can use the breath to manage that balance. So what I'm showing you here is that, and I often ask people if we do this in person, which part of the breath, the in or the out, would be associated with more um, the, uh, the sympathetic, the fight or flight, you know, the arousal side. And if you stop to think about it just for a moment, you might realize that yeah, the in-breath is more energizing, right? So when you're anxious, you might have these short in-breath, like, <gasps> right? You're breathing in a lot more, it's more emphasized. But then when it's time to relax, you might have a big sigh or an exhalation, like, <sighs> so it turns out that the exhalation fosters or supports the relaxation response, the parasympathetic side of the nervous system. And the inhalation gives you more energy and supports that fight or flight. Okay, so what? Well, we can use the in-breath and the out-breath to balance our autonomic nervous system so that we feel more calm in our everyday life. How do you do it? It's real simple. I'm gonna show you a balanced mini, what we call, so a breathing exercise that balances out the nervous system. This is real simple, but the first thing we need to do is try and let our breath naturally become kind of deep and slow. So we can do that first, and then I'll show you a kind of pattern of breathing you can focus on. So, you know, to do, the, to breathe naturally and easily, we need to sit up, not, you don't have to be like military straight, but just enough space that your chest can expand with the breath. So sitting up a little bit, we usually put our feet flat on the floor and just bring your attention to your breath. And at first, don't even try to change it. Just notice what's happening with it here. So breathing in, breathing out, allow your belly to soften a little bit. And so often what we need to do here is just release tension, not control the breath so much, but allow it to just become even so that as you're breathing in, it's about the same duration as you're breathing out. Okay, and then we're gonna add in a little count here, a little pattern. So this is called the wave of the breath. So as you're breathing in, 
you can visualize the wave and count up one, two, three, four, and then straight to an out breath, four, three, two, one. So imagine tracing these nice waves in and out, or you can make a little figure eight, some people like that. But try doing that for a few breaths without forcing the breath, just trying to make it feel pretty calm and natural, but adding in this count and you may need to speed it up or maybe a count of three is better than four, but just you can even close your eyes and visualize that wave. Coming up to four and then down, four, three, two, one. softening through your belly, feeling your shoulders drop down as you go down the backside of the wave. Okay, so just opening up your eyes and you can even note in the chat if you want how that felt, if it was easy or difficult, if it, you know, sort of it brought down your level of tension a little bit at all. And sometimes these take a bit of practice. But the nice thing about these, what we call mini breaths, is that you can do this anywhere, anytime. You know, you don't have to close your eyes. You can do it when you're sitting at a red light. You can do it when you're waiting in line. You can do it when you're getting your blood taken even. So the next one, it's also balanced. We call it square breathing. And here we're gonna add in a little pause. Um, and so the same thing, we're gonna breathe in, say for four, but then at the top of the breath, when your lungs are mostly full, not bursting, you're gonna pause. So just kind of hold your breath and it, maybe four doesn't work, maybe just two. And then as you exhale, exhale again for four. And then when your lungs are mostly empty, we add in a little pause for a two or four. You know, if it's two, it's like a rectangle. If it's four, you're more like a square. Um, so try doing that. Some people find this a little more challenging if you're not used to it, but try just adding in, even if it's very brief, a little pause um, with the lungs full at what we would call the top of the breath kind of. And then exhaling in a little pause at the bottom. And just noting, I don't know if you would have noticed as you did this, if it felt different when you paused at the top with your lungs full versus pausing with your lungs empty, you know, how did you like it? How did that feel? Feel free to little put a little note in the chat if you liked it, which pause you liked better because the next ones we're going to um, emphasize either a relaxing aspect of the breath or a more energizing. So the next one we call the relaxing triangle breath. And here we're keeping the pause just at the bottom of the breath. Why? Why would that be relaxing? Remember at the beginning, I talked that the inhale was more energizing and the exhale was more relaxing. So here we're emphasizing two out of the three sides are emphasizing the exhalation. So it's kind of, um, it's not balanced like the other two, which is like even emphasis on the in and the out. So we breathe in for four and then we immediately go out like the wave. But then when our lungs are mostly empty, we pause. So we're sort of emphasizing that element of the exhale that reinforces the relaxation response. So give it a try. So inhale, say for four. Exhale down the side of the triangle. And then just pause. So there's stillness there for the pause. And then keep going, try it a few more times. And you can adjust the length of the pause to whatever length feels comfortable for you. All right, and we'll finish you off with uh, one more breath that is the invigorating triangle. So this is an upside down triangle where we emphasize the inhalation. So it's the same thing. We're, we're going to have um, a pause just after the inhalation. So exhale and then immediately inhale and then pause. My 
pausing after the in-breath, you might be able to feel your heart rate accelerating a little bit. That's the physiological effect of it. And so if you're feeling, I use this one, let's say I'm driving on the highway and I'm feeling drowsy, I use this one to wake myself up a little bit. So those are just a couple of minis that you can use anytime, as I said, anywhere. And I'm just going to end by giving you uh, a few resources and tips if you're interested and you want to start. Um, everyday mindfulness with just mini breathing exercises whenever you feel stressed or worried or you have a pause. And then there's all sorts of resources too. And as I said, I'll share these slides with you, but there's free apps you can get. My favorite is Insight Timer and then the AMDTX that has our uh, mindfulness-based cancer survivorship app within it. There's many free websites. So these resources don't have to cost you anything. Um, and some of them will have entire MBSR programs that, that I talked about at the beginning that you can take um, for free online and really good uh, guided meditations and resources. So feel free to check some of those out. I mentioned the Society for Integrative Oncology. Our mission is to advance evidence-based comprehensive integrative healthcare to improve the lives of people affected by cancer. We have an annual conference every year. We have many patient advocates involved who come to that. Uh, our 2022 one is coming up in Arizona in October. And then I'm really happy to say that we are hosting the 2023 conference in Banff. Um, and it's our 20th anniversary as well. So check us out. We'd love to have more professionals and also more patient advocates and survivors and family members as well. So finally, to summarize, mindfulness is present moment, non-judgmental awareness with acceptance. It's a way of being in the world cultivated through meditation practice. And programs like mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cancer recovery, train people in mindfulness and help decrease a range of symptoms like anxiety, stress, and depression. And this mindful awareness can help people cope with everyday stressors. I'm gonna end leaving you a bunch of contact information. I mentioned my website with all sorts of uh, scientific papers. Feel free to email me, follow me on Twitter. There's a Facebook page called Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery. And there's a whole website, Mindful Cancer Recovery, that's got lots of different resources as well. Um, and there are some free guided meditations that we use in some of our work at this website as well. So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Carlson. That's great information for all of us, whether we're living with prostate cancer or any <laughs> yeah. kind of cancer or not. So thank you very much.